Welcome, my friends, to the Sage Equay Radio Hour, your home for free and critical thinking, and I'm your host, Mike Williams. Tonight, Martin Kenny returns to the show. Martin discusses how 2020 is the stepping stone into the Bronze Age. We also discuss ways to detoxify and the etymology of words. And so without further ado, here's Martin. Well, folks, Martin Kenny is back with us. And uh, the last show that Martin and I did was a three and a half hour presentation. Well, actually, Martin did the presentation. I listened like everybody else. And uh, the good news is is that between Martin's channel and my channel, uh, there were a lot of views and uh, a lot of people were asking questions and getting themselves very informed, and I, Martin had piqued a lot of interest, I have to say, which I'm very happy about, because as I've mentioned on so many shows, whenever we speak, I really do believe that your work is on the right path, and it's taking the whole geocentric discussion to the next level, and before we started speaking here, we talked a little bit about how the whole Mars mission thing is really, really picking up a head of steam now, right? Uh, we landed on Mars again with an unmanned craft. Um, um, I saw an interview with Elon Musk where he's saying that we will inhabit Mars within our lifetime. So they're, they're really stepping it up now. So this to me is more proof that there is something very, very tangible behind the work that you're presenting. So, and once we understand your work, it's easier to decode their speaking, or what I refer to as masterful speak from a, a Freemasonry perspective. So it seems like things are really starting to come together now. Uh, did you want to comment on that? Because I know you're probably seeing a lot more than I am. Yeah, no, you're very well put, Mike. Um, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, it seems like everything's just sort of starting to fall into place now. Um, the whole Agenda 21 stuff that I've been seeing, um, the whole Mars shenanigans, um, Sun Simulator stuff is resurfacing. People are putting up videos of a second sun. Um, so there's a lot going on there. Um, obviously, the Mars mission um, being the big topic this week. Um, politics in general, uh, especially in the States and in the UK. Politics is just in disarray, you know, uh, Brexit yeah, in the UK, yep. you know, no one knows what on earth is going on. They keep delaying it. I think they pushed it now to December 21st, 2020 is now the deadline, which is interesting. Very interesting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, in America, you've got, um, oh, where do I even start with Donald Trump and the government and everything else that's happening there? Immigration. Um, there's just so much going on. Uh, the fires in California, you know, there's, that's a whole big topic there. Uh, I don't know if there's infighting uh, or maybe there is it's, it's some sort of ritual or they're clearing it out for future plans for something they want to do in California. California seems to be a very str um, strategic um, place on Earth for some reason. You know, Silicon Valley is in California, you know, the world of computers began in California, is run from California. Um, what else is in California? Uh, marijuana, that whole revival movement yeah. um, you know, began in California. Uh, I had a whole, whole list of them. But California is always like a, a trendsetter. Everything starts in California and trickles out everywhere else. So that's interesting. Well, and to add this, uh, for those that follow my McCartney conspiracy work, uh, I'm being told that. September of 2020 is a very key date with regard to what's going on there as part of the, the uh, disclosure process. So the reason why I bring that in is not to plug the McCartney stuff. It's just that there's a lot of things going on that are pointing to the year 2020. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not hearing 2019. I'm not hearing no. 2021. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm hearing 2020. So it's very, very interesting. Um, now, Martin, you did some videos that had to do with explaining what the 2020 uh, event, if you will, if I'm, if we call it an event, how it's going to transpire, what it might look like, what could possibly happen. Did you want to cover that a little bit, or am I getting a little ahead of myself? Here? Yeah. No, no, I can, uh, I can talk about that for a bit. Um, so, I've been researching 
um, past events as much as I could. Like, have we had events that are documented, maybe not as big as the flood, the biblical flood, but smaller ones um, over the last 2,000 years? Is there anything that hints to it um, or, or suggests that um, we've had events? And it's phenomenal. There are many, 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 many topics coming up suggesting that that is the case. The biggest one at the moment is the mud flood um, topic that everyone's talking about. You know, we've had mud floods or resets, um, floods uh, that have wiped out cities or towns or countries. Um, there's the whole thing of the child slaves, you know, the orphans. There was a time when a lot of child slaves were the adults. What happened? So there are all these weird um, timelines, if you like, gaps in time that are inexplicable, sorry. And um, it seems to me, it's quite obvious that these resets that we're talking about, like the one coming in 2020, the one coming in 2020 is a bigger one, but I think every between two and 3,000 years, in between, we have cycles, we have smaller resets. So I did a bit of a, I had a friend over, Josh. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it today. I was hoping to be on this show with him today, but he couldn't quite make it. But uh, we crunched down some numbers. We did a bit of etymology. We did a bit of mathematics, um, sacred geometry. And we worked out a sequence, a mathematical sequence of how space and time possibly, possibly works. And it seems as though every 72 years, we have a reset and it's interesting because 72 every 72 years astrologically the um the zodiac shifts one degree right so every 72 years we go one degree in the zodiac and after 30 degrees that is 2000 years that is when we have um a shift in in in, in ages a zodiac shift so every 72 years when we have a degree change in the zodiac, in the clock above our heads, we have a small reset. Something small happens um, that sort of shifts our timeline. It might be uh, in the form of a flood or earthquakes or natural disasters, but something certainly does happen. And then it seems as if every, if you say 72 times, I think it's eight, uh, I forgot the figure. But anyway, Every so often we have these and they, they, they get stronger. These events get stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger as we get closer to the bigger events that are every two to 3,000 years, which is what we're now approaching. So this one that we're approaching now will be equivalent to the great deluge, the great flood that we had about 3,000 years ago. Uh, the difference is the great flood was water-based and it was catastrophic because we were resetting, like I said in, in the last presentation, we were resetting out of the old golden age into the current Aryan um, Iron Age. So everything had to be wiped out. We had to re reset, start again. This time we are ascending. We're coming out of the Iron Age, heading into the Bronze Age in this realm. Um, and it seems as if this one will not be water-based, this one will be air-based. And it looks as if these resets alternate um, you know, between the four elements. And uh, the last one was water-based. The next one seems, I think, to be um, air-based. Um, so how best can I explain it? Um, I, I had a vision, if you like. Uh, so this is, this is not research-based. Uh, this is very intuitive. This is from within. Um, this is... Uh, uh, if people are going to be asking me for proof or demanding that I show them tangible physical proof, the answer is no, I can't. So this is, you either resonate with it, I could be wrong, like I always say, I could be close, I could be right, I will know when the time comes. But basically the way I see it, or the way I saw it, is we're going to have a blast wave. Uh, the only way I can describe it is a, a, sonic, a sonic boom, if you like or a bomb, which is where the word bomb comes from, that will come from the center and will look like a, a nuclear bomb. And uh, it's interesting because I want to talk about etymology today because a lot of these secrets are hidden 
in our languages, uh, particularly in the English language. English language is extremely, extremely um, encoded and very special. There's a lot of truth encoded in our language. Um, in fact, English comes from the word angle or ingle, which is from the root word angel. So English is actually, the original name for English is angel language. And angel language is now angel-ish language, which is why it's called English. English. Okay. It's not, not the real word. It's not the real language. It's an ish language. But anyway, um, yeah, so that's where the word, the word nuclear comes from new clear you know so words are not how they're spelt words are how they sound the word is in the sound um everything is sound sound and vibration right we always say this so that's literal yep so when we say a nuclear bomb it is a new clear as in c-l-e-a-r bomb and this nuclear boom is what is going to reset our paradigm from what it is today into a new paradigm. Now that reset will be individual um, to different soul groups or different clusters of people, if you like, individually and collectively. So for many, it will be catastrophic. It will be a bad time. It's going to be very nasty and horrible. It will be very confusing. There will be a lot of confusion, anxiety, etc., etc. For others, it's going to be a fantastic time. It's going to be a good reset, a leap uh, into a new paradigm, a good paradigm, whether you're staying in this realm or moving on to other realms or other worlds. Um, so yeah, so this uh, nuclear um, sonic boom that will come from the center will spread from the center um, out into our realm um, out into the other realms and come back again. And it looks as if this will happen over a period of three days. Now, when I did a bit of research on this, I interestingly I came across a lot of um, uh, biblical videos, religious people on the internet talking about three days of darkness yes. that are predicted in the Bible, in the right. book of Revelation. And, uh, and I think there's a lot of truth in that. So it was interesting to see that correlation of this prophecy in the Bible of three days of darkness um, before the coming of um, Christ, if you like, um, or Judgment Day, as they're calling it. So I think this is what they're referring to. So I think this will happen over three days. Um, it will knock down our electro, our, our grid, our electric grid. Um, it will be an electromagnetic current that will ripple through um, the whole plane of the Earth. Um, naturally, there will be a lot of confusion, like I said, no electricity, um, no lights. Perhaps this is why they are putting up a fake sun simulator that everyone's talking about. Maybe um, a fake light for those three days, I don't know. Uh, China is building a fake moon to light up um, parts of China. Right. Perhaps that's part of the whole agenda um, to counteract those three days. I don't know. But it seems as if everything's sort of leading to that scenario. And um, these three days are when I think we're going to have the opportunity, those of us planning to make this pilgrim um, up north, um, that is when we're going to have that opportunity to do that. Now, it's interesting. Um, you know, we see a lot of these movies where they talk about uh, an event happening and there's toxic waste right there's always this toxic with these with this symbol you always see this symbol um right 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 yep it's always toxic and it's always green it's always green you know x-men superman it's always this green stuff that changes these people into superheroes you know um they touch this green stuff and they become superheroes and I know it sounds absolutely crazy, but uh, I'm pretty convinced that there's a lot of truth in that. There's more truth in that than there is fiction. So this green stuff, this represents the aurora borealis, the electromagnetic um, aura that comes from um, the north, the aurora borealis. And that electromagnetic 
current or, or frequency will ripple out all over the earth like it did in 1856 when the last small event happened. It's called the Carrington event, if you look that up. Yes. So this has happened before. And um, I strongly believe that this aurora or this wave will activate DNA in certain people that have um, that are prepared to receive this activation. In fact, this wave is meant to activate DNA. It's meant to cleanse the earth. It's a wave of cleansing. Now, everything that has been happening on Earth over the last at least 200 years, or since the last event, 150 years, since 1860, the elite or the controllers or whatever you want to call them that have been um, running the show in this realm have been building towards this event. Everything. Our food, our water, what we're taught in school, our perception of reality, everything has been geared to control um, how we um, react when this happens, how we receive this shift, and how we move forward. It's all a matter of trying to if, uh, damage control, if you like. So the idea is they've been trying to poison our bodies. They've been trying to put blockers in our bodies. Hence chemtrails, hence GMO foods, hence fluoride in the water, hence the heavy meat um, diet, you know, getting us to eat meat and dairy and things that are toxic to our bodies. They've done all these. These things are just blockers. Uh, they're meant to block our DNA from receiving um, the Holy Spirit, if you like, this okay. green apple ray. Yep. Um, and the idea is when this happens in 2020, those of us holding these toxins in our body, these um, blockers, we will first need to detoxify, take all that out. That wave will come in. A lot of people will get very ill, very sick, very unwell. And that is not because that ray will be killing people. It will be because it's trying to cleanse people. And I think this is what colds are you know we have a flu epidemic every year you know every year around about the same time just before winter we get this wave of flu right people get you know a virus a flu virus and no one really knows where that comes from you know where do these flu viruses come from where do they stem from what what's causing them but it's actually a natural phenomenon it's it's a natural occurrence and it's basically mother nature it's the universe trying to cleanse us so when we have colds and flus, it's, it's, it's the Holy Spirit, if you like, coming through, trying to take the toxins out of our bodies, which is why our nose runs, we cough, because we're trying to take all this junk out of our body. And you'll notice the healthiest people really get sick, really get unwell. You know, since I've become a vegan, I've not had a cold. I've watched everyone else around me getting these viruses and these, I rarely get one. Admittedly, I had one this year, um, quite bad actually. Um, but I think it was sort of my last sort of big, big cleansing. You know, it's interesting because at the, at the same time I was doing a lot of, um, um, I, I began my detoxification, intensive detoxification, which I'll talk about in another video. Um, so I think it was just the, the universe trying to, to help me along. And I felt great afterwards. It was, it was a fantastic sickness for me, if you like. So that's what's going to happen. But this time it's going to be extremely violent and volatile because it's going to happen very quickly it's going to be a, a deep cleanse from the universe and those with the heaviest toxins some people will die because they will not be able to the medicine will be too too much so a lot of people will die those with the heaviest toxins there'll be a lot of deaths those with fewer toxins will live through it they'll get through it and they will come out the other end born again brand new brand new bodies brand new dna healthier, smarter, better than they ever have been. Um, some um, who are almost there will find they will have new abilities, right? They'll realize, oh my God, I've become smarter, I've become stronger, I've become faster, all kinds of things, um, which is something I'll talk about maybe in a future video. 
um, these elements. You know, we always say someone is in their element. You are in your element. There's a literal truth to that. You're in your element. And then, of course, those who are fully prepared, those of us who are completely detoxifying now, who are completely getting ourselves as ready as we possibly can be, there's no way to completely detoxify and get everything, and get yourself completely 100% clean. It's not possible. The idea is to do your best to get as clean as possible. And those of us who have done the work leading up to this event, um, there'll be less detoxifying to be done to our bodies, to our DNA. So we will experience the full benefits of this Holy Spirit, if you like. And we'll have um, full DNA activation within those three days. And this full DNA activation will help us get um, to the center, to the garden. Um, I still don't know exactly how, whether it's going to be a physical pil pilgrimage, um, whether there will be a, will they will have help from beings um, um, from elsewhere. I don't know yet. But I do know that there will be a DNA activation that will smoothen that process and help us along. And that includes everywhere on Earth, no matter where you are, whether you're in the south, in the north, along the equator, um, everyone's going to have an equal opportunity. Now, Martin, a couple of things. As you were speaking, I wrote um, some notes down here because uh, it, it triggered some thoughts. One is uh, you were talking about the flu and the whole cleansing process with the DNA and so on. It's very interesting to me that winter is flu shot season, right? Yeah. So they're tying the flu into the winter. Yeah. Uh, also, a lot of movies that have to do with um, uh, viruses and, and flus, and even in the news, they talk about uh, various flu strains. Uh, we have um, uh, like swine flu and bird flu and stuff. It's almost, to me, it's as if they're conditioning that some some cataclysm, some catastrophic type of event yep. will take place in the future. So there is some conditioning going on. You know, I look at this stuff today and, and I know that what they're telling us is, is, uh, is not real from the standpoint of the magnitude of what they're trying to put across to us is not happening. But I do have to think that it is some kind of table setting for something in the future, yep. in my view. The other thing I wanted to talk about was uh, you're talking about activating the DNA and science or quote unquote science has been talking about junk DNA for a very long time, yeah. which says that junk DNA, at least my understanding is it's not activated. It's just lying there dormant, right? So mm -hmm. this is something else that lays in nicely to what you're, you're talking about here. And last but not least is the, uh, the Carrington event. And I just want to read this uh, to so some of the folks understand what we're talking about, Martin. Uh, the Carrington event was a solar storm of 1859. It was a powerful geomagnetic solar storm during the solar cycle, well, during solar cycle 10, 1855 through 1867. This is in Wikipedia, by the way. A solar a CME hit Earth's uh, magnetosphere and induced one of the largest geomagnetic storms on record. And the date that they have it pegged at is September 1st, the 2nd in 1859. So, again, for, for folks that think that what Martin's talking about in 2020 is not possible, uh, we have a documented event going back to the Carrington event. And uh, this is something that I, mean, I remember reading about a long time ago, uh, maybe even when I was back in high school, talking yeah. about the Carrington event. Um, so, in your view... That's one of those, uh, I don't want to call it minor because it didn't sound like it was very minor, but it was one of those, we'll call it a minor reset. Yeah. Something in the interim. Yep. Yep. Definitely. Do you, think that had, Not... do you think that had anything to do, I'm, I'm sorry, Martin, but do you think that had anything to do with this whole mud flood theory? Because I, I, I watched the mud flood videos. I haven't commented much on it. I find it very interesting. I think there are some very good proof points that are being brought forth by people who are doing the work. And then I thought, well, perhaps this Carrington event and the mud flood go hand in hand. Maybe they are definitely together. Okay. Definitely. Definitely. I'm, I'm almost certain of it. You know, I've been 
recently watching a lot of videos about the mud flood and uh, the data correlating. It seemed as if something did happen mud flood wise um, around about the mid 1800s. So they're saying between 1850 and 1870, it looks as if we had a mud flood of some sort. Um, and then it's interesting that the character and event falls in that timeline as well. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, it's, it's just, it's just, it's a no brainer for me, really. It seems as if it's, it's very much related. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I have a friend of mine, uh, Christopher Gardner, we're going to talk later in uh, December, but his theory was that uh, with regard to the mud flood, that there were uh, huge volcanic eruptions. And that is uh, what started the whole process. And again, can the volcanic eruptions be due to the uh, the Carrington event? It, it could be. Yeah, that's a theory that he has. So it's interesting that a lot of people are starting to look at this type of information now and drawing some conclusions. And when you listen to the various folks who are doing the research, you mm -hmm. can really begin to connect the dots on some of this stuff, and it starts to make sense. Now I don't know whether we're right or not, but yeah, it's it's worth I think looking at and seeing if the dots do connect, in my opinion. Oh, definitely. Oh, yeah. definitely, definitely. And, you know, all of this is all hypothetical. It's all theoretic, um, obviously. Right. Uh, because it's it's something that's gonna, that we think will happen in the future. So there is no way of saying for sure. But like you're saying, all we can do right now is try and connect the dots and read into the signs and um, the information because knowledge is power. So once we have knowledge, we can empower ourselves to make um, informed decisions and to prepare ourselves, not always physically, but it could just be prepare ourselves mentally, psychologically, emotionally, as well as physically. And that is all that I'm trying to do. I'm trying to prepare myself and anyone else who resonates or, or yeah, who resonates with this information. And if nothing happens, great, we're gonna be healthier, right? And we'll move on from there and see where it takes us. But if something does happen, thank God we were prepared, right? Well, that's what I was going to ask you because you're being very bold. You're putting dates out there and uh, stepping forward and saying, this is a likely scenario or a possible scenario. Mm -hmm. And you, I think you just answered the question because I was going to ask you what happens if nothing happens because there are going to be a lot of people that are going to listen to you and I, they're going to say, these are two crazy dudes <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> talking about this stuff. So, you know, what happens in your mind if, uh, if it's just, you know, December 21st, 2020 through the 24th or the 25th, it's just like any other December 21st to the 25th. Um, what happens? Nothing happens. Nothing happens. We, there you go. <laughs> life goes on. Life goes on. And we continue to ask questions. We continue to seek for answers. We continue to try and figure out what is going on, where we're heading, where we are, and we continue on the journey. So I'm not too worried about being wrong about anything at all. Um, I'd rather be prepared and wrong than unprepared and wrong. Right. So I'm willing to take the hit if nothing happens and people attack me and say, see, told you the sky's crazy, nothing happened, life goes on as usual. So what? So what? Life goes on. Uh, but <laughs> it's really hard to ignore the signs that are out there. You know, yes. yeah. it, it's, it's, you know, I, I'd be extremely naive to ignore the signs that are right. out there. Um, so I'm just putting it out there and just saying, well, look guys, this is what the UN is saying about 2020. This is what they're saying about vaccines, 2020. This is what they're saying about 3G, 2020. This is what they're saying about this, 20. So many topics are leading to 2020. Why? I don't know. I don't know. I'm giving an hypothesis of why, and I think it's to do with this event. Well, and the Mars landing, the unmanned Mars landing is a precursor. This is yep. table setting, right? Uh, two yep. years before it actually, or something, we think might happen. Um, so there are a lot of, like you said, there are a lot of signals being sent mm -hmm. by the elites, by yeah. the ruling class. And uh, again, if you understand 
how to decode their messages. Yeah. Because they do masterfully speak. It's 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 cloaked. It's it's encoded. And if you know how to decode it and read between the lines, you have a much better understanding of what it is that they're actually talking about. Definitely. The other thing, Martin, I wanted to mention is people have asked me this too. They've said, well, you're doing these shows with Martin Mike, and what if nothing happens on you know in 2020 in December? And my my response is that the actual foundational or the construct of how it works, the cosmic clock, uh, the whole cosmic egg theory to me is very, very important. So if the dates are off, that's still a process of discovery because we are in a process of discovery, I mean, plain and simple. Yeah. Um, but the actual foundation of, of the work that you're doing, understanding how it works and how it flows to me is the most important piece of this. And that's for me. And that's how I respond when people ask me. Yeah, okay, the dates could be off, but the construct, I think that's spot on, my personal view. Yeah, I, I, I agree, Mike. I agree. Like um, uh, 2020, the dates that we're giving out are very much hypothetical like you know there's I can't, I can't prove that there's no way of me verifying it it's just an intuitive feeling based on the information that i'm finding and and seeing etc etc however like you're saying the construct the overriding skeleton of all of this i am pretty sure of i'm pretty sure there's enough evidence um to 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 point to this being closest to what it could be um, so, so I have no doubts about that. I have no doubts that we have resets um, every so often. There's no doubt in my mind about that, that we go through cyclical timelines. There are resets that happen, um, and we will have a reset soon. Now, I'm not the only one saying this. Every culture, every religion says the same thing, right? Christians will tell you there's a time when Jesus will come, something big will happen, People will die, people will be judged, some will go to heaven, some will go to hell, blah, 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 and the whole world will change forever, right? So Christians, this is laid out in the Bible, it's laid out in all the holy books right. of this, this return of the Messiah or of some sort of Messiah. So um, I'm not the only one, I'm, I'm in good company there. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty sure. So the event, fine, if it's not in 2020, maybe it's in 2022, maybe it's in 2025. Maybe it's in 2030, maybe it's in 2050. We don't know. All I'm saying is at the moment, the telltale signs are pointing to 2020 at the moment. Yeah, I agree, I agree. Well, now did you wanna uh, talk a little bit more about 2020, Martin? I know you wanted to also talk about etymology and, and uh, the words that we use. Is, is that a good time to segue there or did you want to, um, or did you have something else to talk about? Yeah, well, I just wanted to close off by saying a lot of people, I'm, I made a video recently because a lot of people are asking, well, how do we prepare our bodies? How do we get ready? How do we detox? You know, I've, I've had immunizations. I've been vaccinated from a child. Uh, I've been eating meat. Um, I, I, do I have irons? Is it too late? And the answer is, um, I don't have a clear cut answer. I'm not the Messiah. I'm not God. I don't have a magic wand and tell you that this is what you need to do or this is wrong or this is right all i can do is tell you what i'm doing based on what i think is best and based on the research that i've seen so for me my favorite protocols my favorite subjects of detox are for one um, is plant-based diet that's the first one you know uh i can't stress that enough i cannot stress that enough uh Getting on a plant-based diet will clean your body automatically. Whatever toxins you have in your body, plants that God gave us that grow from the earth, Mother Earth will cleanse you. So anything that does not come from Mother Earth, that does not grow out of the earth, is toxic. It's poisonous. You're not meant to consume it. We're only meant to consume what Mother Earth gives us. And that's plants. So fruits, vegetables uh, particularly, those will naturally balance your pH. They will naturally get rid of acidity in your body. They will naturally um, alkalize um, your body and correct your DNA naturally on their own, just by doing that, eating right. So that's the first one. The second one is water. 
you know, they poisoned our water. They're putting all these things, particularly fluoride in our water. Yeah. So, you know, I've got a distiller. I bought a distiller. I've been drinking distilled water for the last two years, in fact, since I became a flat earther. That's one of the first things I did. I bought a distiller. So I've not had fluoridated water in two years. I cook with it. I drink it. Um, in fact, if I drink tap water, I get sick. I get ill now. I can't drink tap water anymore. My body rejects it straight away. So I can't stress that enough. Get a distiller if you can, or if you can find a way of distilling water. Distill your water, make sure you get rid of the toxins, and that as well will decalcify your pineal gland, particularly in your in your brain. It will help regulate your acidity in your body, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the other one is iodine. Um, so, you know, Himalayan pink salt, you know, so that is the best, best um, source of iodine. So I, I use Himalayan pink salt with everything uh, and it's fantastic stuff that, that will just balance your iodine levels and, and everything else. Uh, people ask about iron. I did a video recently where a doctor explains the difference between heme iron and non-heme iron. So there are good irons and there are bad irons. Uh, so iron found in meat and in milk and dairy is not good. That's bad iron. It's excess iron, and that does damage to your body. And iron found in certain plants and vegetables is good iron. You need that iron. You don't want to be deficient of that iron. Um, so that is important. You know, um, iron is good. I'm not saying, you know, when I say get rid of toxic irons, I'm not saying have no iron in your body. You need iron, but you need the correct irons and also the correct amount of iron. Too much is bad. Too little is good. If you're eating vegetables, the vegetables will regulate that for you naturally. They will do it automatically. Meat can't. Uh, the other one is um, cannabis, believe it or not. Uh, cannabis is a great source of um, detoxification. It cleanses your, um, it unlocks certain things in your DNA. In fact, human beings, we have something called an endocannabinoid system, right? exactly the same as the cannabis plant. So cannabis has got the same DNA code as human beings. You can research this, I'm not making it up. You know, it's the only plant on earth that shares the same DNA code as humans. Now, I think there's something in that. So when you um, ingest cannabis, when you eat it, when you rub with it, I'm not talking about smoking it and getting high and abusing it, which is what a lot of people are doing, unfortunately. They abuse it. So they're not being virtuous. So there must be a level of responsibility and, um, and, and being wise about going about it. It's not about abusing it and getting high all the time. It's about using it in the natural, in a good way to cleanse yourself, to detoxify. So you can smoke it and you know, if, 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 you, if you get a high from it, great. Just don't abuse it. Um, you can rub it on, you can create oils with coconut oil, rub it on your body, you can ingest it, you can um, drink it, all kinds of things you can do with it. Um, there are ways of, in, of getting the benefits of cannabis without getting high as well. There are ways of getting THC and um, CBD into your system without getting high. For those of you who don't like that feeling of getting high, you don't have to get high. So cannabis is very, very good. And this is why they've demonized cannabis for a very, very long time. You know, That's right. There was a time when uh, cannabis was openly used, not so long ago, uh, pre-World War I. Cannabis was used as official medicine before pharmaceuticals, before opiates. Um, all medicines were cannabis-based. Um, the first car ever built was built with hemp, which is a form of, is, is, is a, is a, uh, part of the cannabis family. Um, you know, there's hemp milk. There, you can make all kinds of things from hemp. Hemp clothes, you can build with hemp, hemp houses. So this stuff is extremely powerful. And this plant can change the world um, if it's used wisely. And I think the elites know that. Uh, we're shifting ages, which is why there's a big push to legalize cannabis, because people are waking up to this and they want to control it. So if they legalize it, they put tariffs, they tax it, they control 
how this cannabis is being used, way it's being used. They can make money from it and keep us still imprisoned, even though it's meant to be freeing us, this thing called cannabis. So yeah, those would be my, my top, my top uh, for me, you know, plant-based diet, distilled water, iodine um, through Himalayan salt um, and cannabis. Um, that's, that's the advice I'd give on detoxifying. Yeah. And just so folks know, um, I'm a vegetarian, so I'm not a vegan, but, um, I've been a vegetarian now, Martin, for over a year and a half, maybe pushing two years now. And I don't miss meat at all, at all. And I find it very interesting. In fact, um, even folks in the truth community that become very, very upset when you talk about veganism or being a vegetarian and not eating meat. Uh, I've seen some of them actually put videos out uh, to vilify those of us that have gotten off the meat wagon. And I, I really don't understand why it upsets them so much because my attitude is if you want to eat meat, eat meat. I mean, I don't agree with it. I mean, I used to do it, but I'm off it now. And if somebody decides not to eat it, then you know they have decided not to eat it. But this um, visceral type of reaction that we get from folks that just don't agree with being a vegetarian or a vegan is quite amazing to me. I, I, in fact, I really don't understand it. I don't, I don't know why somebody would be so attached to such an issue that they would actually go out of their way to, uh, I guess they do it because they want to validate the reason why they continue to eat meat, I guess, right? And they want to be able to, um, just to say, well, it's good to eat meat and here's why. And here's why those other folks, the vegans and the vegetarians are crazy people. But um, I know you've seen those videos too, right? Or you've seen people talk about that stuff. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, it's cognitive dissonance. It's no different to ball earthers when you present them with flat earth information. They will find every reason, every excuse, they will research and they will try and disprove you that you're crazy. The earth is not flat. It's definitely a ball. We're spinning. Look at this evidence. There's scientific this and that. We, it's definitely a ball. And they will fight you to the grave, right? Because they're not ready for it. Yeah. Or because they want to justify the same thing with vegan, veganism and, and meat eaters. It's another program. So you then say to someone, you shouldn't be eating the flesh of other beings. And they will defend their belief and say, yes, we should kill others to nourish our bodies. We should consume flesh and blood because it's good for us. We need it. It's good. You're crazy. You're stupid for not eating meat and, and blood. Um, so I get it. You know, it's a program. It's just another program. Like yeah. the religious folk will you say, look, guys, this stuff is not literal, man. This Allah stuff, this Yahweh stuff, this Jesus stuff is not literal. Like, don't take it literally. There's no man in the clouds sitting in there. And they'll come back with all the proof under the sun. They'll say, read this verse. And this preacher said this. And this guy said this. And it's written over here. And, it's, and they'll do everything in their power to try and justify their belief. So I get it. You know, we have got all these programs that are set into our matrix, into our reality, into our world. Uh, we've been in the Iron Age. Uh, we've been in the Dark Age of confusion. Um, and a lot of these programs are very difficult to deprogram ourselves from. You know, um, one that I battled with recently was cannabis, marijuana, right? So for a long time, I wasn't sure about this cannabis stuff, you know? I've never been a big smoker. I've smoked cannabis here and there in the past, but I, I had my reservations and I thought, you know, and people came to me and said, no, Martin, this stuff is good, you know? I had some Rasta friends, Rastafari friends, who said, this is God's plant, you know, you know our, Ancient traditions and cultures told us you need this plant to heal your body, to do this and to do that. And I just wouldn't have it. I thought, nah, you're just trying to justify your, your addiction to the drug. You know, yeah. smoke marijuana here and there to relax, but, you know, not like the way you, you say. It's not until recently when I really said, you know what, I need to remove my blinkers and, and look at this plant and research it and study it with an open mind and see what all this marijuana stuff is about. And I, my, 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 my mind was blown. You know, I've, I've realized that um, actually I, I was wrong about vilifying um, the extensive use of it or how important it is. It is extremely, extremely important. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's a program that I had to, to get over uh, and have now and have a good 
um, understanding and relationship with marijuana, but I don't abuse it. And that is the difference, you know. Unfortunately, a lot of people end up abusing it. So, yeah, yeah you're right. Yeah, um, there's a great uh, discussion. I think it's on one of my YouTube channels. Uh, maybe I'll put the link down below where Graham Hancock talks about the fact that he was addicted to to marijuana and um, that he got to the point where he actually uh, stifled himself. He was, you know, he really wasn't functioning properly. And so he, he did a lecture saying that you cannot overindulge because if you overindulge, it's like anything else. You are going to have issues. So it's not meant to be something that you just you just dive into and, you know, and, and willy-nilly don't pay any attention to the quantity that you're taking in, you know. And um, so I'll put that link down below so folks can take a listen to Graham Hancock. Um, the other thing, Martin, sometimes I think about, I know I'm going off on a little tangent here, is you're talking about programming. And I thought to myself, even though I'll talk about myself, I don't believe I'm, I'm programmed. Then I think to myself, but maybe thinking you're not programmed is a program. <laughs> it is. Yeah. <laughs> you're right. Yeah. Uh -oh. so, so the the point being is you really have to stay vigilant, right? You really have to keep your radar up. Uh, you just can't sit there, uh, you know, and, and say, okay, well, I've, I've broken out. I'm fully awake. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for the next big thing because the truth of the matter is you, you really don't know uh, the things that you believe or the things that you think you understand. They may be part of the program. They may be part of the conditioning still, right? So – it's Definitely. an ongoing process of trying to break through it. Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. You know, up until about three weeks ago, Mike, I, I felt, you know, I felt I'm there. I think, you know, I've, I've, I've broken the programs and I have a good understanding of this and I'm ready. I'm ready for this. And a good friend of mine, Josh, came to live, him and his family came to live with me, uh, came to visit us. And him, his wife and his son were with us for a couple of weeks, two, three weeks. And he's been off grid. He went two years. He went to Spain. He went off grid to connect with Mother Nature. No television, no electronics. You know, he was growing his own food, plant-based, clean water, clean food. He was completely disconnected from the world just to try and find himself and find answers. And uh, when, I, when I started talking to him and he started telling me things, I realized, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, was I kidding myself. You know, yeah. I'm nowhere near ready. And same with him. So he thought, you know, I've, you know, I've done all this and there were things that I was teaching him. And we both eventually sat down and said, wow, you know, we're, we're both children. We think we know it all. We don't know anything. Here we are. We've met. We've brought two different things. We've, we're teaching each other different things and realizing that we've got a long, long way to go. So the things that he's brought into my life um, that have opened my eyes to things that I hadn't seen before or had a very shallow inner standing of, um, has opened my awareness even more. But it's humbled me more than anything else. It's made me humble. It's made me realize that just when you think you're comfortable and you've got it sussed out, you don't. You don't. This, this never ends. You're always going to be learning and growing, always. That's right. That's what yeah. actually truth-seeking is. It's a never-ending cycle of pursuing the truth. Yeah. If at any point you stop because you think you know, you're making a mistake because you don't know. <laughs> There's more to learn. It is always Absolutely. more to learn, you know. Yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. So, did you want to move into the uh, the language and etymology piece of this, Martin? Um, yeah, I did. Um, so that's that's one of the things that uh, my good old friend um, Josh brought along etymology. So he came in. The first thing I was saying, Martin, words, language. It's all in the language, it's, you know, everything's in our language. It's all coded in there. I sort of said, well, what are you talking about? Yeah, I know, you know, language is, you know, I was like, no, you don't understand. You know, it's in our language. You know, our words are spelled. And I was like, well, yeah, I know, you know, words are spelled. It's called spelling. And he says, no, it's literal. It is literal. I said, what are you talking about? Like, what do you mean it's literal? So we went through about a week of me having cognitive dissonance and going, well, you know, you know, really? Like, that sounds a bit crazy. Magic and, you know. Uh, but eventually I broke my cognitive dissonance. I got it. The penny dropped. And uh, uh, once we started diving into it together, my, oh, my, oh, my. You know, we just unlocked a whole big Pandora box. Uh, 
I wouldn't even know where to begin. Like I was saying, I was hoping you'd be on here uh, with me, we'd present this together, but I'll just give a little flavor, a little taste of some of the things we decoded of this language, uh, this thing we call language. So that's a good way to start, you know, decode, right? You've got D and code, right? So that's two words there. So D means something and code means something, right? You can also declutter, yeah? You can D many things. So D is a prefix to something else, right? Another good example is ice. Right, we all know what ice is, I-C-E, right? We have something called the pole ice, right? We have something called just ice. We have something called off ice, right? So you can see pole ice, police, just ice, justice, off ice, office, um, and we say you are skating on thin ice. That's a saying that we say. So what I'm trying to show you here is that our words are literally magic spells. Literally, right? When you break down all these words, they have a root or core meaning, right? from this thing we call angel language, the root language. And this angel language is branched off things like Sanskrit, which is one of the root core languages, languages like um, uh, Hebrew, which is another core uh, root language. Um, all these root languages come from an original source language, which we might call the O language. The O represents the whole. Right? It's interesting because you've got whole, H O L E, you've got whole, W H O L E, right? And both sound the same, but they are spelt differently, but they actually mean the same thing. Whole means the whole, the circle, right? right. The Garden of Eden that we've been talking about is a crater continent. It's a hole at the center of the earth. It's a crater, it's a hole. This is where we get things like holy spirit. Spirit from the hole, right? Spirit just basically means essence, right? The essence or energy. So energy from the hole. The hole is the crater at the center. This is Eden, okay? This is where we get words like occult, right? A cult, the root word for uh, where cult comes from is culture. That's where we get the word culture from, cult, right? If you have a culture, that is your cult. Your culture is your cult. The occult is the culture from the O, from the hole. Okay, the whole being Eden. So occult knowledge is knowledge from Eden. That's what it means. That's where it roots from. That's where we get them. Um, you get words like Eden. So Eden is E den. We all know what a den is. A den is a home, a place of rest, right? So what does E stand for? E stands for ether. So Eden is the ether den. Now something we discovered while decoding this language, which is where I realized how important this language is, is Eden is different to the Garden of Eden. Those are two different places. So they're actually two realms at the center. There's the Garden of Eden, and there's the place called Eden. I see. Eden, okay. Eden is the very center. 
This is what we call Mount Meru, Mount Zion, Mount Olympus. This is the core, the heart of the universe, where these Polarians I was talking about live. That is Eden. That is not where we are going. Not yet. We are going to the garden of Eden. The garden outside Eden. The garden that encompasses Eden. That's why it's called the garden of the etherical den. That is where we're going. That's this realm where the Aryans live. So we've got the old cult, like I said, culture from the center. We've got E den, etherical den. Um, we also say occult knowledge is hid, hidden. The den that is hid. Hid means um, covered, unseen, obscured. Yeah. obscured. It's hidden, right? So occult knowledge is hidden. Occult knowledge of the hidden, right? Here's another one, right? We talk about the Bible. We call the Bible the holy book. Again, holy, the center, right? So knowledge, the book that has knowledge of the center. Of course, the Bible is coded because we say the Bible is a testament, isn't it? Test a meant. Test a mind. To test your mind. It's a testament. Right? So it's telling you. The spell is in the words once you break them down. All right? Now, a lot of the countries where we live have also got a lot of this stuff hidden within them. So, for instance, in the Scandinavian countries particularly, we've got countries like Sweden. Right? Sweden. Southwest Eden. That's where Sweden comes from. You got countries like Norway, which is actually North Way. Yep. That's where that comes from. You've got countries like Finland. Right? Finn is what? Finnish. The Finnish land. These are the Finnish people. This is where the land of this realm finishes. Finland. You've got countries like Den, once again. Mark. A mark is a sign. Right? Sign for where the Den is. When you're in Denmark, this is a sign that you're near the Den. Denmark. Right? You've got countries like Greenland, which is quite obvious. Greenland, which touches, like we said, um, Eden. Greenland, because that's where the aurora borealis is. The green astral ray, Greenland. That's self-explanatory. Right? So you can see as well, in all these Scandinavian countries, they were named as codes to roughly tell us where we are in relation to um, this place, Eden. Very interesting, Martin. Very, very interesting. So I am not going to go too far into it, but I just wanted to sort of give you a rough sort of uh, view of how important this is. I will be doing videos in the future where I'll be going into depth um, with our language and how far this language goes and how deep it goes and how much we can decode um, our reality based on our lang wage. Um, very, very important. Very, very important. And this might be a reason why they push English to be a worldwide language. Yep. Right. And um, I've read a fabulous book. It's, um, it's The Secret Science of Numerology. And I'll put the link down below where that book gets into the fact that even the words that we speak, the sounds that 
we make with the words are very, very important because they are frequency. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things where we just take it for granted. You and I are speaking right now. We're not thinking too much about uh, the way we're speaking or the words we're speaking or how we're speaking, I should say. But you and I are having a, an exchange in frequency is what we're having right now. Absolutely. Okay. And so, um, yeah, I'll put the link to that book down below. And if you're interested, folks, uh, take a look at it. She gets into numerology. She gets into, uh, you know, into the Kabbalah, into um, a whole bunch of stuff, into language. And I found it to be very, very informative. So that's my little commercial for the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's very well put, you know. So getting even deeper, you know, like you said, decoding these words to their root sound. I mean, you could even go even further, you know, and say, what does the S stand for in, in, in language? What's this S? Where does it come from? Right. right. The S is the sine wave, it's the snake, it's the, it's the frequency. So S is one of the most important letters in our alphabet, which is why there's so much symbology of snakes, of, of uh, sine waves, of waves, um, very, very important. So going back to all of this, it all goes back to just being symbols. Our alphabet is just symbols. And these symbols are put into different sequences that create spells, right? So when we now have a language and we have sentences, right? What is a sentence? When you sentence someone, what are you doing? Right, you're giving them a term. You are yes. penning. That's what a sentence is. So when you sentence, when you create a sentence, you are sentencing someone to your spell of whatever you are saying, whatever you're spelling out. So <laughs> the best way to put it is the root of all of this, like you're saying, is frequency and it's sound. So it's not the actual words that have power. It's not even the symbols that have power. It's the sound. It's the resonance of what yes. you're saying. Right. So true language in its base form should just be like singing opera that has no, um, is it opera? Or, or singing a, or making a melody that has no actual nuances to it because everything is sound and frequency. And that is what root language is. One of my favorite ones is OM, right? So OM is asking for help. It's the sound for, I want to connect. It's this SOS sound to the universe. We hear the Buddhists go to the temples and they, they chant Om, right? Right. And they tell you that when we're chanting Om, we're trying to connect with God, right? We're looking for answers. Now, when you tell a lot of people that, they might say, oh, that's just rubbish, you know? Yeah, they're not connecting with anyone. It's just some ritual or whatever. And then you say to them, if I ask you a question and you don't know the answer, what sound do you make? Um. Look, um. Um. And a lot of the time you look up. Um. You're um -ing. You're um -ing. Subconsciously, without knowing it, your spirit knows to do that subconsciously. You're not taught to um. No one's ever taught at school that when you don't know the answer, you must go um. We just do it naturally. So that is a good example of how sound, you know, OM is one of the, the best examples of that. You know, so OM is a original sound, an original frequency of sound that we still use to this day. Unfortunately, we've lost most of them. There's a whole code of them that we could use. And if you learn to speak this original angel language, um, I promise you, we'd be able to do amazing things. We'd be able to rewrite or or spell things into manifestation, literally. Even when you mentioned SOS, uh, Martin, the S is the sine wave, O is the whole, and then the sine wave again. So you have the whole in between the two sine waves. Brilliant. Right? Brilliant. Brilliant. SOS, the whole, bit. excellent. And, and that's all it is. And that is, that is the decoding of our language. And another one is the word, I'm sure you've seen this word before. Right, spell it correct now. 
a witch. Yes. W i t c h. And we're all told a witch is this evil satanic person that casts bad spells and does magic and bad things. And witches are bad, right? We also have another word in English. Which which one? Right. Right. When you say which one, you are saying what choice. The word which implies choice. So is it a coincidence that the word we use to give someone choice sounds like the same word used to describe someone who does magic? Yeah. Right? So which literally just means someone who understands how to code language, right? And by doing that, they're able to cast spells in their favor, sometimes good, sometimes bad right right so what we're doing this is called witchcraft the craft of witching this is what this is it's the craft of witching when you're decoding things when people decode the bible christians right those christians will be watching and saying oh you're you're talking satanic stuff you are also witchcrafts because a craft is a skill and the skill of witching is the skill of decoding, of creating choice. So when you are preaching your Bible, you're practicing witchcraft because you are spelling the words from your book. You're casting spells from your testament. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. You're going to you're gonna make them very happy, Martin. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I, I'm sure I am. Uh, but unfortunately, the truth is never comfortable. You know, it's yeah. never, it's never. Uh, 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 you know, people want the truth, but you know, like they say, they're not ready for the truth. It's always a bitter pill to swallow. Uh, but that is the truth of it. You know, we're all witches and we're all wizards. We're all casting spells every day. You wake up in the morning and you say good morning. You know, we all know this one. Um, you know, when you're mourning, you're mourning what death. But why are we mourning in the morning? Why, why do we say good morning? What are we mourning? Why is it called waking up? Awake is something you do. You go to awake when someone's died, right? Right. It's to celebrate death. Right. So why is it waking up? Right. We're waking up and saying good morning. We're saying good morning at awake. So everything, everything comes back to casting spells, which is why media, TV, right, education, books are the greatest tools. For mind control yes mind control is another way of saying witchcraft exactly the same thing right programs witchcraft when you have a program you are putting certain spells right in a certain sequence to control people's minds right but that's now black magic that's that's dark magic so there's good witchcraft and there's bad witchcraft just like there's duality in everything there's good and evil in everything so what we're doing, truth is, we are white magicians, right? White magic, good magic. We're not doing black magic. And that's the difference. So I'm not saying that all magic is good. There is definitely dark, bad magic, but there's also a balance to that, which is good, positive magic. And all you truthers out there, keep doing your magic. Fantastic. We're changing this paradigm. That's all your right. posts and uh, telling people of flat earth, Great witchcraft. Yeah, exactly what we're doing here. <laughs> and, and white magic is also referred to as divine magic. So like you said, Martin, there is the, you know, there's the positive and there's the negative. Yep. The positive and the negative. It's the duality. And uh, that's just the way things things are. So, uh, yeah, you can't just say all magic is bad or all magic is dark because it's not. It absolutely is not. So this is fascinating. Now, this this came from your friend Josh. Yeah, this came from Josh. Um, you know, like I said, two years he was up in, in Spain on a farm. He bought himself a farm out there and and he basically just went deep within, isolated and pretty much figured out a lot of this stuff on his own. Um, and this is really shallow. A lot of people will be familiar with this. This is not even deep. It goes even way, way deeper than this. When you really break down the words, um, it's phenomenal how deep it goes. Um, um, so we'll, we'll, we'll get 
into it a little bit further down, um, but I thought maybe I'll I'll break the ice in in today's show. Yep. And then um, later on, we'll possibly really fine tune it and get into um, the nuts and bolts of it. Yeah, we should see if we could get Josh to join us. I know he couldn't make it today, but um, maybe the next time we get together, because this is fascinating stuff. And I have to admit that I don't know a lot about this. I mean, I know it at a uh, topical level. Yeah. Uh, because of various books I've read and all this stuff, like the book I just mentioned earlier. But um, I know it goes very, very deep. And it's something that I would really love myself personally to learn more about. So, yeah, we should do a show on this. And if we can get Josh to join us, Josh, if you're listening, you have an invite. <laughs> See if we can bring him on the show to uh, to help us understand it some more. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's beautiful because once you start decoding these words, um, for one, it confirmed a lot of things for me. So Josh said he he watched one or two of my videos. And he had come to the same, the cosmic egg and all that, he had come to the same conclusion using language. So he decoded the language and then he, he, he figured out, you know, the different lands in Eden and Ether Den. Okay, there's a place called Eden, the Garden of Eden. It must be at the center of the earth. So he hadn't seen any of those videos. So when he saw the video, I was like, oh my God, this guy, how has he figured this out? You know, he must be doing the same thing I'm doing with language. So when he came to me and I said, I've, I've never done this language, I've discovered this my own route, my own way, it was a beautiful moment of realization that there are many, many routes um, to Rome. There are many streams to the river, yes. um, to the ocean. It, it all leads to the same place. So we came to the same truth using different routes. So it was a great confirmation for me. Well, that's why it's important for folks to be doing whatever research they're doing, genuine research, that they do that. And they specialize in it and they, they dig deeper because what happens is exactly what you have just told us, Martin. There's a convergence at some point. So somebody be working on something and they come to a certain conclusion. Somebody else is looking at something else that's completely different, but they they reached the exact same conclusion. And so then what happens is you bring these together. And the more of these pieces of the puzzle that you bring together, the more validation there is that we're most likely onto something that is uh, truthful, something that's far more truthful than what we have been taught or shown or, or conditioned to believe. So um, that's why I don't agree with uh, some of the truth movement out there, just to go off on a little bit of a tangent here, when they want everybody to converge and to focus on uh, the biggest problem or priority that we all should be looking at. So we shouldn't be looking at that. We shouldn't be looking at this. It's really uh, whatever. Just pick something. Uh, and I've always disagreed with that because you, you can't have that. You're not going to solve anything by putting everybody in one boat and saying we all have to be rowing in the same direction on a specific priority that somebody has, by the way, has declared is something we should be looking at. So somebody's taking a role of a leader and saying, forget all that other stuff you're looking at. What I'm saying we should look at is what we should be looking at. Everybody get in the boat and let's go. And uh, I, I think we're going to, and I know we will, shortchange ourselves amazingly uh, yeah. if we do something like that. It's very important that people look at whatever it is that resonates with you, look at it. And what will happen over time is we will find each other. Yeah. And we will then be able to share our research and piece it together. And we'll get a better understanding of the bigger picture. I mean, at least that's my take on it. Yeah, brilliantly put, Mike. Fantastically put. You're absolutely right. You know, we we shouldn't box ourselves because the moment we box ourselves in any box, um, you're now part of a program. You're you're now part of a, a box. Think outside the box. We always say it. Right. Right. So you're absolutely right. Um, you know. Um, I try not to do it. I, I find myself getting caught up in it. Sometimes I'll watch a video and I'll say, oh, you know, you should be doing this. And I think to myself, hang on a minute. Right. I'm trying to boost this person. I need to take what resonates and ignore what doesn't. And hopefully we're all going to meet in the same place. In the same way, there are a lot of things that I'm going to say that might be wrong. And I'll come back full circle and go, oh, I've come back full circle. And I'm now connecting the dots with things I maybe didn't agree with a couple of years ago or a couple of months ago. And this is the beauty of this whole process of learning. We're constantly, constantly learning, growing, experiencing, 
it's a journey. It's a journey. Yeah, and it's a big puzzle. This is the way it's been presented to us. So it's not going to be handed to us on a silver platter and say, oh, here you go. Here are all the, the answers to the mysteries. Um, the way it's been presented to us is, let's just imagine that it's a one million piece puzzle. And yep. the pieces have been strewn all over the place. Yep. And they, you know, they'll say, well, uh, if you find most of the pieces or, you know, because we're never going to probably find all of the pieces in our lifetime, but if you can find as many as possible, then you will start to get the truth. And that's just the way the process works. I, I wish it was a whole lot easier. I really do. I wish it would be, uh, I can go buy a book somewhere and yeah. I could just read all about it and understand it and, and go on with my life in a better way. But unfortunately, that's not how it is. And so we have to take these these tidbits and these pieces of the puzzle and we have to put them all together and it's going to take more than you and me and a handful of other people to uh, to put the puzzle together. It's going to take a lot of us doing some really hard work, brainy work, uh, to be able to um, to put it all together. Yeah, absolutely. And, and something that I realized recently that really humbled me was I had this... I had this urge for a long time to try and get the answers, to try and figure things out as much as I could, as quickly as I could. And, and I thought my soul would be at peace. I thought, well, if I figure it out where we are and, and I figure out how this works, I'll be happy. That'll be it. I'm done. I'm happy. And I realized that that is a fallacy in itself. Um, that is not possible. Um, you will not find happiness in, in thinking you're at the end. Happiness is in the process of finding the truth and reaching the truth and then looking for a new truth and finding the answers. So the happiness comes from the journey, not the destination. The destination is a massive anticlimax a lot of the time. You know, we've always had this. I'm sure many people will be familiar with this. You look forward to something so badly, you know, you can't wait. And then it happens and you're like, it's not as great as I thought it was going to be. It's the same thing with this whole truth thing. So the cosmic egg, you know, that journey, if I think back, I was living in a world of euphoria as I was discovering it and putting it together. It was a fantastic time. And then I got depressed a little bit after that because it was the anticlimax. I was like, all right, you figured it out now. Now what? <laughs> now what? Okay, it's done. So that's it now. Yeah. So you, you go down the rabbit hole, you, you look at something else, you make more discoveries and you relive that euphoria of, wow, you know, this is, this is how it is. And. And then same thing again, you reach the end and you're like, okay, it's done, now what? So I'm now enjoying the process a lot more. I'm not in a rush to get to the end. Um, I don't want to know everything right now. I want to buy my time nice and slowly, nice and gently until the end, whatever the end is. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a very interesting journey, Martin. It really is. Um, now, let me, let me ask uh, this question here. We mentioned it before the show started, uh, and as part of the lead-in, what are you seeing as far as more and more people um, catching on to your cosmic gate theory and your work? Are you seeing a, a, an uptick uh, in uh, the, the level of interest? Um, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say the numbers are. The numbers are steadily there, but what I would say is there are more and more people who are aligned to this information, who get it, or who are on a similar journey. And I think what's happened is I don't think anything I've, I've been presenting, I don't think there are many people who've been converted or changed or who've gone, I was completely asleep and I watched Martin Kenny and I'm totally on this journey now. I think most of the people were already on their own journey, but in different fields. Yeah. So I'm finding a lot of people who were in the new age movement, you know, in the new age, you know, the hippie movement, who've then come across my work and gone, oh, right, okay, this makes sense. So they've almost, um, it's, it's almost helped them clarify things a bit more. So I think there's more of a case of that rather than, it's converting people or waking people up per se. I think this stuff, this deeper occult knowledge is not meant to wake people up. You know, if you're dead asleep and you see this, you will run a mile. It will scare the hell out of you. 
you just it's too much yeah. you yeah. almost have to gradually make your way into it so i think there are a lot of foot soldiers i call them the foot soldiers so flat earthers um you know vegan warriors people preaching veganism flat earth spirituality a lot of that is foot soldier work so it's entry level stuff so if you're a nobody like myself when before i woke up i had to come through flat earth and then after flat earth into veganism and then start coming into this deeper occult knowledge and diving deeper if i had come across this two and a half years ago um I doubt I'd have run a mile, I'd have gone, do you know what, this is too scary. Um, so I think this stuff is not meant for entry level people. Um, and this is why I think maybe they have secret societies. I think uh, I now sort of understand why secret societies were created originally. Um, it's because, you know, you'd be stoned. You know, there are many people, if they could, they would want to kill me for saying the stuff that I'm saying. If they could, they would because it scares the hell out of them because it's so far removed from their beliefs and their belief system um so in terms of numbers in terms of people waking up to this i think those who are on the same journey as us um the number is getting stronger not more but stronger there are a lot more people who are now have a deeper understanding of this so i noticed a year ago there were people who were going I like how this sounds. I don't understand it, but it sounds sounds true. I like it. It makes me feel good. It, there's a there's a resonance that I like about what you're saying. I don't yet get it. I don't agree with everything, but you know, keep going. And now I'm finding there's less of that, and there are more people saying, "Beautiful, I get it. I'm coming to the same conclusions." And then they are adding their own pieces to it and saying, "Oh, here's another piece of the puzzle, Martin. Have you considered this? Have you considered that?" So there are now people who are, we are now more of us on the same wavelength. It's not as if there are a handful of us leading it. You know, when I started this deep occult stuff, to me, Santos was the leader. Like there was no one like Santos on earth. No one was speaking like Santos. No one had an understanding like Santos, as far as I was concerned. Yeah. Whereas now I think many of us have caught up. You know, we're now on an even playing field. Yourself, me, Santos, and everybody else who's in this realm, we all seem to be on the same wavelength now. There isn't anyone who's ahead of anyone. It's almost like everyone's catching up and we're all now riding the same wave. And that's really encouraging, that's fantastic. You know, I had a conversation with somebody recently and they were talking to me about my work and the shows and stuff like that. And they had said that, um, that all truth, all information, in essence, all of the mysteries, I'll state it that way, should be made available to everybody. Yep. And I disagreed. I disagreed oh. from the standpoint I said that, um, let me just phrase it this way. It will over time be made available to humans, to human race, right? As we progress through the cycles. But when you're in a specific age, like we're in the Iron Age, this is how I explained it. You, you cannot give the mysteries out to everybody because it will be misused it will be misinterpreted and if that's the case then what's going to happen is then you're going to have a situation which is it's not going to be good and and let me get your Im impressions on this martin maybe you will agree with me maybe you won't but years ago when i first started looking into this and i started looking into the occult and i started looking into the illuminati and the secret societies and the freemasons you know I, like a lot of other people i thought it was just flat out bad dark stuff but as i've gotten more and more into this don't get me wrong there is bad stuff taking place but that bad stuff is part of the age we're in it's part of the duality that we have to experience but there is a pyramid there is a pyramid construct I call it the pyramid of power and contained within that pyramid of power are initiates and adepts that are, are really the stewards of the, the cycle that we have to process through. So the cycle in, in this example would be the iron age as an example. So there has to be an entity that ensures that the iron age plays out the way it's supposed to play out. So, this is what they do. They're essentially driving that car and taking us down that path. And so then 
when we move into the Bronze Age, that pyramid still exists. But now the, uh, the, the process and the approach is different because now we have moved into a different cycle or a different age, but you still need stewards to ensure that that Bronze Age, that that also plays out the way it's supposed to play out and then through the silver and then through the gold. This is a theory that I have um, as I've gone through this work. Uh, there is a process of enlightenment that I believe that they're trying to get out to as many uh, as they possibly can. We called it in our first or the three and a half hour show, separating the wheat from the chaff type of approach. And um, that's what I think is taking place because when you start digging into this stuff, even when you're digging into aspects of it that are dark and negative, if you look at it from the proper perspective, you are getting nuggets of information, nuggets of truth that are enlightening, or there is a quote unquote illumination within your mind of, of maybe a better grasp on existence, a better grasp on quote unquote the reality. Um, so I know it's a little long winded. So do you agree or do you think there are places where I've fallen off the tracks? I wholeheartedly agree. That's fantastically put. I, I, I couldn't um, add anything to that other than um, what you're talking about is the twin pillars. Yes. We may talk about the twin pillars. Right. And Josh really explains this best. So I hope I do it justice. If you're watching this, Josh, I hope I'm not going to make a hash of this. <laughs> but everything in our reality, good and bad, is a 9-11, it's a 9-1-1 call. Everything in our reality, good and bad, is a 9-11 event. And that 9-11 event can either put you deeper into sleep or it will wake you up, right? Do you go left or do you go right? If you go left, you fall asleep. If you go right, you awaken. Same thing with your brain, your left and your right side. And that's what the twin pillars represent, right? The nine represents the mother. Nine is the last number um, in the number system. Right. And then it goes back to 10, 10 is one. So nine represents the whole, the end, right? So 9-11 is always a choice. When they did the 9-11, there are many people that were fooled by that event that 9-11 event, the actual 9-11 event. There are many people that were fooled by it. There are many people that fell for the bait even deeper. They fell for the, uh, the laws that were passed after that. They became even more fearful of, you know, certain people and certain factions. They bought it hook, line, and sinker. They fell deeper into the matrix. And there are also many people that were awakened by 9-11. 9-11 made them go, hmm, something's not right and their journey of awakening began. So one event had two outcomes. And this is the same for everything in our reality. Everything is a 9-11. You are doing the Paul McCartney stuff, right. you know? That's a 9-11 event, you know? For many people, it's gonna make them fall deeper into sleep or it's gonna trigger them to wake up. So you're absolutely right in what you're saying, Mike, that uh, it's not meant for everyone all the time. If, you, if everyone woke up, at the same time, the game would be up. This reality, this existence would be over. There'd be no point in doing it. That's right. Right? The world would end. It would have to end. Right? So we can only wake up to a certain level if we do wake up. And we can't all wake up at the same time. Some will wake up to a certain level. Some will go beyond that. Some even more beyond that. And it will just get thinner and thinner. The road gets narrower and narrower and narrower and narrower the more you wake up. So the way you know how awake you are is when you look around you and you see how many people are around you. If there's a whole lot of people behind you, you're not yet awake. You're not awake. Good point. You're still on, you're still on the wide road. The day you wake up and you're like, Shit, I'm alone here. Am I the only person who's figured this out? Then you're awake then you're awake. You're now a part of a small group of illuminated people. 
And then it becomes more and more difficult to speak to people because now people don't understand you. People don't get you because you're now speaking things that are way beyond their level of awakening. Yeah, so, even within the truth movement, because when, you, when I talk about, uh, we talk about the Illuminati, which are within the pyramid structure. There are 66 degrees, if you will, within the pyramid. That's why we keep seeing the number 66 all the time, folks. I'm, I'm going to cover this in a major Paul is Dead uh, McCarty conspiracy video that I'm hoping to have out within a week or so. Um, and you talk about enlightenment. They become very, very upset with me or, or very upset with anybody who talks in those terms because they will say, are you saying that these evildoers are enlightening you? That you're using their terms, you're, Mike, you're using their terms. You're saying it's going to illuminate you. That's that's their wording. That They are the Illuminati. And, you know, and the, what my point being is, is that that's the isolation, right? Because here I am, even within a community of, of truthers, and if I bring that up, and I do bring it up because of the work that I do, there are a lot of people that get very upset with me because they don't see it the way I see it. You know, and because they don't see it the way I see it, they just essentially peel themselves off and away from me. And so you do, uh, when you get into certain topics, you do wind up in a parade of one person, you. <laughs> you know? And that's how I feel many times. Uh, you know, I don't, I, there's not a lot of people, as you and I have discussed before, that you can sit down and have these types of conversations with. It's, they are few and far between the number of people that you can have uh, these talks with. And uh, it's good that we have a network of, of folks that we can, but many folks get very, very uncomfortable when you get to certain levels of exploration and certain levels of discovery, like with your work here as an example, like it, as you've mentioned, this make a lot of people very uncomfortable. It makes a lot of people in the mainstream flat earth community uncomfortable. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, so and, and even, you know, they have a certain level of awakening. You explained it great in the last uh, in the last show where you said there's kind of these steps that we have to ascend. Right? This step here means you have this much knowledge and then you learn a little bit more and then you step to the next step and so on until you get to the top step and nobody knows where the top step is. But uh, anyway, so I'm babbling on here. Um, but I agree that if you're standing by yourself or if you're standing with uh, uh, just a couple of people, then you're probably doing some good work. If you're standing with a whole crowd, yeah, you're right. You're running with the pack. And that, that means that you're most likely stuck in the matrix. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you, flat earth, funny enough, flat earth is one of the biggest, uh, it's, it's a fantastic secret society. Right, it's got a, it's got the exact same pyramid system as the Freemasons, yeah. flat Earth community. So when you join the flat Earth community, ninety five percent, ninety percent of the people are going to be Christians, right? It's flat proves God. That's majority of flat Earthers. Yeah. That's most. That's the crowd. That's the mainstream, right? And then when you step out of that box and you go, oh, I'm still a flat Earther, but I'm not part of the Christian crowd anymore. You're now an outsider. You've now, you're now beyond that now. You're now in the next degree. Yeah, right? you've been ostracized. Yeah, you've been ostracized. You're now, you're now in the spiritual community. So yes. you're branded, you know, with with another term. A new ager. A new ager. Blah yeah. blah blah blah. Yep. And then you go beyond that. You get to the next one where you start getting this occult stuff. And then it's like, oh, you know, you've gone too far now. You know. So those people that were now in the spiritual new age, whatever they now ostracize you as well and say, oh, no, no, we agree with some of the stuff, but some of the stuff he's saying now, mm, no, nah, this is getting too dark for us, too much, yeah. yeah, right? And that just carries on and carries on and carries on and carries on. So the deeper you go down the rabbit hole, the more layers you peel back, the more leave people you're going to leave behind. Now, timing is everything. Timing is so important. If we, if I had reached the stage 20 years ago and I had known this knowledge 20 years ago, and I didn't have the internet to share it with people like yourself. The only people I'll be able to talk about with this are people in secret societies. I would have had to join a Freemason somewhere, Freemason organization or yeah. Illuminati, just so I can have people to talk to. 
So even if my intentions were good, I'd just be like, I just want to be in company with people who, who understand this stuff. So I'd have to go in a Freemason temple and say, look, I, I don't want to do the dark stuff with you. I just want to talk to someone. I need someone to talk to because no one in the world knows this. And you guys obviously know this stuff, right? So luckily we've got the internet now. I don't have to join a, a secret society because I can find people who are like-minded right. anywhere in the world through the internet. And this is what secret societies are. And this is why a lot of people have joined the secret societies because over the past, they figured these things out <laughs> and they, they had to speak to someone. They needed to speak to someone or otherwise you'll go crazy. You go nuts. Yeah, it's funny. I've been accused of being in a secret society. I, I have been uh, accused of being a Freemason because of the work that I've gotten into. Uh, I'm an agent of, of something. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe an agent of truth. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but not an agent of the NSA or the CIA or whatever. Uh, it's interesting how when you get to certain levels of information, people really, they do. They, they, they build a wall. And they have to somehow label you. They have to put you in a box. They have to categorize you so that they can feel comfortable that they shouldn't listen to what you're saying. You know, it's like, oh, I don't, I don't want to listen to this. He's bursting my bubble. And so I'm going to fabricate a reason as to why I shouldn't listen to his stuff. And, and then the labels come rolling out. You know, that's what I found with my own work. I don't know about yourself, but have you been accused of being a Freemason or part of the Illuminati? Yeah, loads of times. Oh, loads of times. Yeah, yeah. I've been called a Jew, believe it or not. He's a Jew agent. I just think to myself, wow. But, but um, one of my favorite ones is, um, I'm sorry I'm going to be picking on the Christians because they're the ones that are normally the most vocal. And it's, it's not personal. I'm just giving an example. But I had a friend of mine who came to see me and we we're having this debate, which we quite often have. He's quite into his religion. And, uh, and I just said to him, just stop it. He says, you know, this stuff you're teaching, it's satanic. It's all, you know, from the devil. And, you know, let's stick to the to, to facts. Let's stick to the Bible, you know. And I said to him, all right, let's, let's be logical about this. Let's just stop and think about this logically. Would you agree that evil entities have been running this realm for thousands of years? And he said, well, yeah, of course. You know, it even says in the Bible, the devil runs the world. And I said, excellent. And I said, now, if you were the devil and you wanted to hide the truth, what's the first thing you would do? You'd mask it. You'd make it scary. Right. You'd put all kinds of dark things around it so people are afraid of it, right? You'd, you'd, you'd put skulls and bones and, you know, you'd use certain words and magic and dark and, you know, bad words, words that evoke fear in people. That is how you would hide the truth, isn't it? And then what would you do? Because obviously you wouldn't want the people to be too dumb to the point where they can't function, but you don't want them to be too smart to the point where they're as smart as you and they challenge you. You want them just enough so you can control them. So you'd give them some truth, but you'd mask it. You'd hide the truth, you'd code it. Like the Bible, right? We'll give you a little bit of truth, but we'll give it to you in a way that it's coded that you'll kind of get it, so you'll kind of be awake, but not too awake, like the occult knowledge. We'll keep that real knowledge. We'll keep it, and we'll put all these buffers to scare you. We'll put the baphomet, you know, that devil with the horns, in yeah. front of our, of our work. The moment you Google occult, the first thing you see is a baphomet. And straight away you go, oh, devil, click out. I'm not going in there. Buffer. So I said to him, and that's all it is, and that's all they've done. Now, once you become smart enough, you figure out that these are just buffers. Don't be afraid of numbers. Number 33 is not an evil number. No, right. It's not evil. It's, it's just a number for crying out loud. You know, owls are not evil. Right. They're beautiful birds, right? You shouldn't fear owls. Yeah. All these things, you know, skulls and bones are not evil. A skull is not an evil thing. You have one on your head. You have bones in your head. <laughs> They're not evil things. They're just things that have been put to mask the truth, to scare you away from discovering these occulted truths. Yeah. And that's all it is. So you can remain ignorant, you know, unfortunately that's what it is. And you can remain in that world of illusion or 
you can step into this new world of saying, you know what, I'm going to look at this stuff without fear and try and understand it as best as I can. But like you said in the beginning, there's a time and place for everyone. It's not meant for everyone. Not everyone is meant to awaken to this stuff now. Not everyone's meant to get it now. You know, there are people that have to stay behind and be, you know, and be part of this new world order. They have to be. There are people that have to go to other places and colonize other places. There have to be other people that are going to send into other places. It's all part of one big, beautiful system um, of life. It's the circle of life, right? We say the circle of life once again, the whole circle, the holy the circle of life. That's all it is. Right. Know thyself. It's all about knowing who you are and where you are and being happy. So now when I meet Christians and Muslims and religious people and people who are not vegans and people who vehemently oppose me, I, I don't have a need to try and preach them anymore or try and convert them anymore or to try and make them understand where I'm coming from. Because now, I now fully understand that that is not my place. I am not here to, I'm not God. I'm not here to judge or to correct or fix anyone. Um, in the same way, I'm not, sometimes someone will tell me something, if I reject it, it's because I'm not ready for it, right? And I don't want them to ram it down my throat, right? So you say something, if I reject it, leave me alone. I'm not ready for it yet. When I'm ready, I'll wake up to it and I'll, and I'll move forward. And that's what it is. So those who are in that boat of Christian and Jesus is coming, good for you. Crack on. You do that. That's your road. That's your journey. I wish you all the best. The Muslims, same with you. The Vedics, you know, literal religious people, occultists, people that are in the dark arts, you know, the, 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 the black magic, Satanism. Yeah. Those people do that. You carry on doing that. That's your road. That's your journey. You do that. Those of us who are on this path, we will carry on doing what we're doing. And everything will just work itself out in the end. Yeah, that's exactly how it works. Uh, everybody is on a different path. There is a different rate and pace with regard to where people are at, not just from their physical world experience, but from their soul perspective, from the non-physical. So, uh, yeah, so we're not going, it goes back to what I said before. You're not going to get everybody on the same page in the same boat rowing in the same direction. It's just not going to happen. No. You know, so, right. So everybody has their own unique path. And uh, mine is very different than yours. We have, we sync up in many aspects, but there's things in your life that you're doing that I'm not doing in mine and vice versa. That's just the way it is, you know, so. Well, Martin, I don't uh, want to take up too much more of your time. Uh, believe it or not, we've uh, been chit-chatting for two hours. Wow. Yeah, I know. It's gone really fast. Um, is there anything else you wanted to add? Anything you wanted to wrap up with? Um, yeah, just, just a quick one. Um, energy. You know, we always say that everything is energy. Um, someone has asked me the other day about... Um, Baphomet and the whole... Um, the trans, you know, the transgender agenda that is happening at the moment, the um, transhumanism thing. What is all that? You know, what does it mean? Where is it heading? Where is it coming from? The best way to put it is that um, <laughs> there is a code for everything. There is a code of conduct. Once you get deep into occult knowledge, uh, Freemasons will tell you that there is a code of conduct in every aspect of reality. Now, this realm that we live in has got a code. And there is a number to that code, believe it or not. And that number is 432. I'm sure you've heard of that, 432 hertz, Schumann resonance. Yep. That is the code of this resonance. And that code, within that code, there are certain things that we can do and we can't do within that bandwidth of code. Now, in other realms, they have their own codes. You know, we talk about the different realms. In Eden, for instance, that is a different etherical zone. They've got their own different code, right? And I think their code is 418 from what I've researched. They've got a, their code is 418. And that code has got its own code of conduct. So, in Eden, for instance, because everything is etherical, four-dimensional, everything is governed through energy. 
you know, because they had a higher rate of consciousness. They see this reality for what it is. We don't see energy. We see matter, right? We judge things by matter. We see a sex. When we see someone, we say, oh, this is a black male. Uh, he's male. He's this. You describe him by his matter, right? You don't see the energy of that person. Now, in places like Eden, where they are consciously a little bit more ahead, they see the energy before they see the matter. So in Eden, um, like I said, they don't see matter first, they see energy first. So they see things for what they really are, a true form. So things like gender, there is no gender in Eden, not in the way that we see it, right? So gender is a construct, male and female, these are iron slash bronze age constructs. Once we reach the silver age, golden age, those things start to peel away and fall away. So for instance, something as simple as sexual intercourse. In this realm, the code of conduct is for life to be created, for energy be, to be exchanged. That energy we call the energy of lovemaking. There has to be a process called a sexual act. And that sexual act has got a protocol, it's got a code, there are certain things you have to do for that to happen. Now, when you are in a different realm, like Eden, in a higher dimensional realm, sexual intercourse is not the same. It's not a physical thing anymore. It's now an exchange of energy. Again, because there is no sex, there is no male, definitive male or definitive female, which is why I say God is not a male nor a female. You know, you hear that a lot. God is androgynous, right? right? God is not a man or a woman. And that's where that comes from. So in Eden, for instance, this is something else that me and Josh came, we figured out, and this is also hidden in a lot of the um, occult knowledge, esoteric occult knowledge. Um, the Baphomet represents that archetype of these beings in Eden. That's what it represents. It's a goat. Why is it a goat? Because everything begins with Aries. Aries is the first sign. When I showed you on my cosmic clock, right? The right. epoch began in the age of Aries. So they are the goat people. The goat is the one that climbs the mountain. It's, it's, the, it's the, the first one. That's why that Baphomet is a goat. The Baphomet is also a male and a female. So it's showing you that androgynous nature of male and female energy being one right you also see the sun and the moon you see the two hands the hand pointing up the hand pointing down the hand pointing up points at the moon the hand pointing down points at the sun all that is also symbolic of the dual nature of what the archetypes of our sun and our moon represent which is a whole different presentation so the baphomet itself once you understand the hidden meaning that that is coded within it is a beautiful symbol. There are many truths in that. But of course, it's been masked with satanic yep. things and associated with Satanism to scare people. So lovemaking, for instance, in Eden, is not a sexual, is not a, there is no intercourse the way we know it. It's just an exchange of energy. And we think, our theory is, lovemaking could be as simple as something like dancing. You know, when you're dancing with someone, you're creating toruses and vortices and energy. You know, you're spinning people around. You're rubbing yourself against someone. There is friction there. There is an exchange of energy. There's passion. There's emotion. You know, there are dancers that are passionate. There are dancers that are subtle, that are more, um, you know, that are, um, there's more fluid. There's more flow in them. So all of that is going back to this occult the old culture of how right. things really work. So lovemaking in Eden could be as simple as, as dancing with someone. Now, if you and me were in Eden and we decided to dance together, that could be regarded as making love. In that code, you're creating a love frequency, not in the perverted way that we know it as in this realm. Now, that is all well and good, and that's fantastic. Unfortunately, what these occult Satanists are doing they are bringing in the Eden code and trying to bring it into this realm's code. It doesn't work because now it becomes something else. It now becomes perverted because that code of conduct cannot work over here. 
in the same way, if I'm in Eden and I'm dancing with a small child, that can be regarded as making love. Right. right? But if you're making love to a child in this realm, exchange of energy, it's pedophilia. Because that code of conduct does not fit in with this realm. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it makes sense. It makes sense. I guess the question somebody would ask is why are they trying to bring the code of Eden into our domain? Is that is that part of the transition process or is it something where they are trying to corrupt the code? So this is where it gets really interesting. <clears throat> we talk about this event that's going to happen and these tourist fields opening up and different beings going into different realms. Now in Eden, we call this place, you know, we've been talking about the black sun being Christ. This is where Christ is. This energy of Christ is at the center in Eden. Now, if a being from Eden, an Aryan being from Eden is coming out into this realm, what would you call them? The Antichrist. They're going against Christ. They're going against the Christ energy coming to where we are. They are the Antichrist. So just like there are some of us who are going to be going into Eden, there are going to be Aryans who are coming out into this world, right? Flow of energy. And there are those that are going to be going out into the other world, into the other realm. And there are others from the other realms that will be coming into this realm. So there'll be all these different beings from different realms mixing, coming in and out, which is how we get different races and different mixes of genetics and, and all this, like I explained in the last video. So we believe that when this happens, when this event happens, there are going to be Aryan beings, Baphomet beings, that are not male or female, right? That are going to be both male and female. They haven't quite transitioned. They're still going to have that, that Eden code, even when they're in this realm. And it will take them quite a while before they begin to disintegrate into this, this code, into this realm. This is where the story of vampires comes in. This is what you might call a vampire. This is, this is what you call um, the Antichrist. So these things are going to come in. They're going to be like gods because they're going to have a much higher consciousness than us. They're going to be very smart. They're going to have remedies for diseases. They're going to heal the world. They're going to bring things together. And these are the beings. This is what they're trying to prepare us for. This is why you're seeing this transgender push. They're trying to get us used to seeing beings that are not male or female it's really confusing are you a man are you a woman what are you i don't understand it's a predictive program they're programming us to get used to that idea you're seeing this programming of unicorns or beings with horns so do these beings have horns i don't know perhaps perhaps it's a way of programming us to get used to seeing that that picture so all of this is predictive programming to help us cope when these beings from these other worlds come into our world, it won't be too much of a culture shock because they're going to come with their own cultures. And a lot of these cultures will not be in the same code of conduct with us. And that's what it is. So a lot of them might be pedophiles because to them, in their minds, they might still see everything as energy, a lot of them, if they're really dense beings. So they might do things that we will frown upon, but they won't see it as bad, right? Perhaps some of them are already here. They will become the pedophiles and we'll think, well, why are you a pedophile? Because that person coding is wrong for this round. They've got the wrong code. They're doing things. A lot of pedophiles don't think they're doing something wrong. To them, they're like, I don't see what the big deal is. I'm in love with this child. I'm exchanging love with this child. What's the big deal? Now to you and me, it sounds crazy. Like what? I, what do you mean what's the big deal it's it's wrong right because we know the code of this realm we know that that cannot work in this realm that we're living in now not in that way because it becomes perverted it's it's not right right, right. and that and that's what all of this is so all this confusion we're seeing baphomet you know they're putting baphomet out i think they put one out in america yep. one of the towns in you know in the town square center they're trying to you know, Celine Dion recently launched a clothing brand, New 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 or something. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Gender neutral. Yeah. Yeah. New, new, new. Right? It's new, new, new programming. That new, 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 called new, 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 could also be something new, something new, something new. This is new, new, new. It's coming in. 
So they are trying to prepare people's minds for what's coming, the gender neutral thing. So these beings that live in Eden will be gender neutral. And those of us going to, to Eden, eventually, over time, we will also begin to simulate into that code. So when we get there, we are going to be like lower beings, right? Because our code will not be right for that realm at that time. It will so, take us quite a while to get so to that. So it's two incompatible codes, right? It's like taking a, an operating system for Apple OS and Windows and trying to make them work together. It's not going to work together because it's no. two separate codes. Yes. And Baphomet, you know, is androgynous and androgyny is a very, very key component of the ancient mystery religions. Uh, I, I did a show actually on Baphomet going back about two or three years ago with Sophia and uh, it also represents spiritual alchemy. Mm -hmm. All of this and it is very, very misunderstood. It's too bad because when it's misunderstood, people go off on the wrong tangents. Yeah. And they draw the wrong conclusions. So maybe I'll put the link down to that uh, show in the description box as well. Uh, Martin. But that's a very, very interesting uh, take that you have, that it's two different frequencies, two different codes, and you can't mix them. Because if you try to mix them, there's going to be a lot of confusion yep. either way. Yep. A lot of complications, yep. misunderstandings, right? Absolutely. Yep. And, it, and it's interesting as well. You know, we were just, uh, uh, we had a shamanic session, if you like, where we, we really went deep into all of this spiritually and uh, we both got the same sort of answers and uh, as within so without as above so below when we get to eden we're obviously going to settle on the outskirts of eden right we're going to be on the outskirts of eden on the edge right we will not be able to go any further because we will not, we, we're not ready right it's almost the same with where we are now we will become the Africans of Eden, the Southern Hemispheres, right? So we always say people in, in the Southern Hemisphere generally are a lot more behind than the people in the Northern Hemisphere, right? That's just a fact. It's not racist. It's not anything. It's just a fact, right? Yeah. It's the same thing in Eden and all the other realms as well. So when we get there, we are going to be the equivalent of what we think Africans are. We're going to be the ones that are going to be backward. Our code is going to be very, very backward. We're going to be doing things that are not quite in sync with the old culture, with the Eden culture. And it will take us a time, it will take us a lot of, a long time before we begin to assimilate ourselves into this new code, into this new culture. And eventually we'll begin to assimilate and migrate into other parts yeah. and to the whole thing. So we would so have down we would have down level code, if you will, if we use IT yeah. uh, analogies, and then it's going to be a process of upgrading yeah. and updating the code. And that I don't know how long that's going to take. Yeah. I'm assuming it's gonna take quite a while. Absolutely. But uh, yeah, this is a very, very interesting way to uh to describe it, Martin. Yeah. From a code perspective. I think a lot of people will will understand it that way. Yeah. It's it's all about code and genetics. You know, our DNA has got a code. All DNA has got a code, and these codes are there for a reason. They're there to match certain frequencies at certain times in certain places. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting. So, again, right now, this transgender stuff, they're trying to change people's codes. The code has already changed. 20 years ago, 25 years ago, if you had said to, some, if you had said to someone, being gay is going to be a normal thing, like it's going to be accepted, you'll be arrest, arrested for, for being anti-gay, people would have laughed at you and said, what are you talking about? You know, we, we don't tolerate that. that. That is not the right code of conduct. Yeah. We don't do that. Today, it's just normal. You meet a gay person, and it's just like, oh, it's normal. Yeah. It's not, you don't, you don't blink, you don't think twice about it. The code is already changed. So that code is already getting us used to the idea that the physical matter is not as important as the spiritual matter. A gay person will tell you, you know, you people, you ostracize us and you judge us. We see love. I'm in love with this man. I'm not in love with 
the body, I'm in love with the man, right? So the moment, because we are, the code is changing, there are people who will be in the old code still saying, no, I'm not having it. I'm a traditional person. This is what tradition says. I'm going to go with the traditional code of conduct. And there are some saying, no, 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 no. Things have changed. We've progressed. The world has changed. You're behind. You need to catch up. You know, you're still a racist. You're still homophobic. You're still this. You're still that. So the code is slowly changing. Unfortunately, I don't know how this is happening, but it seems as if maybe the code is being rushed. It seems as if I think this should have happened a long time ago. It should have been a nice, gradual, gentle shift into all of this. And it's almost as if we're being rushed into this. We're being shocked into this. And I think this is very, very wrong. But again, we're in the Iron Age. So it's kind of to be expected, you know. Um, there's a lot of confusion, anxiety, and stress coming with it. But it shouldn't be like that. It should be a nice, gradual flow over hundreds, if not thousands of years of gently assimilating into a new, different code. So I don't know how all of this is going to play out in, you know, when, all, when it all happens, when the event happens. Perhaps we'll revert. Perhaps they'll stop it. So right now there's a big clash of code, you know, and then it will reach a stage where when the new world order comes in, they will rewrite the code. We will have a new world order, which will be a new code of conduct for everyone. So no more confusion. This is what religion is. This is what money is. This is what how um, energy, this is how everything works. This is now science works. Everything will have a new code. And that's what the new new world order is. It's a new coding of our reality. Okay, so this is going to be extremely controversial for some people to get their heads wrapped around because of the, you know, the, the, the conditioning with regard to the New World Order. Uh, also, not understanding the concept of two different codes. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not advocating pedophilia, folks. What we're just saying is, is that there is a difference in a completely different understanding of uh, what certain things mean. So it would be like using a word in one language that means something to us, but using that word in another language means something very, very different. Yeah. It, it conflicts. It, it's, yeah. Even though the word may appear to be the same, or maybe it's pronounced the same way, or it's very similar, they have two different meanings. Yeah. And that, that's what Martin is trying to explain to us here. So, so just listen, pause, and just try to get your head wrapped around the possibilities here. I just want to put that out there because I think some folks might be uh, misconstruing what it is that you're explaining to us. Yeah, I mean, I mean at, this, at this point, you know, I'm not even talking, I've, I've stopped talking to people who are not yeah. on the same wavelength as us. I'm not even talking, I, mean, I don't even bother. You know, there'll always be those people who are, who don't get it and they just, looking for a fight or I, I don't know, whatever. Yeah. I really don't care about them. At this point, I'm just speaking to the people that are on the same journey as us to prepare us for where we're going, to have a better understanding of how this works as from, from where I see it, from my perspective, and give us a little bit more clarity, hopefully, of where we're going, what to expect, where we're going, what to expect, even for those who are staying behind um, but sort of want more clarity on what this new world order is, how, why things are happening the way they're happening. It's just to give people clarity. And like you said, Mike, it's really important. I'm not advocating for or against anything at all. You know, all I'm saying is I'm explaining perhaps why certain people are doing certain things right. or behaving in certain ways that we don't understand. I don't understand it yet. I don't understand it. I get it but I don't understand why it's happening in this realm. So, and, but now because I understand the whole code thing, I'm not sympathetic to it. I'm not saying that I now, I'm sympathetic to a lot of these things. What I'm saying is I get it. I understand why it's there and why it's happening. It's not for me, it's not something I'd advocate or encourage, but I understand it, I get it. Yeah, same with me. I mean, I understand it at a conceptual level. Yeah. Conceptually, I understand it, uh, but I do struggle with some of the stuff that's going on. It doesn't feel right to me. It's it's yeah. not normal to me. It it falls yeah. into the into the realm of 
abnormal, some yeah. of it bizarre. Uh, it's uncomfortable. Uh, it's repugnant and repulsive. There's stuff that's going on. So it's one of those things where, like I said, from a conceptual level, I can understand it and I can see the argument or the explanation. But then there is that the physical aspect of me and even the mental aspect of me that is in this domain, in this realm that says, mm, that just doesn't seem right. It doesn't feel right. You know, I, I don't think so. Yeah. So it is kind of like a, it's a balance, I think, right? Of, of understanding the concepts and then weighing it against where you're at uh, in, in the existence that we interact in. And I think that's why I said before, I think you're, explanation of two divergent or two very different codes coming together and conflicting is perhaps what is going on. I don't know. Yeah. But it's, it's a great way to, uh, to put it out there and to get people to kind of chew on it, I, I think. Yeah. And it's, and it's, it's it, like you're saying, it's so, so confusing. You're so right in that it's, it's conflicting, it's confusing yeah. because you don't know where to draw the line. Like, where do we draw the line? Like, you know, you'd say, okay, the whole gender thing, I get it, fine, people want to be different genders. And then you think, well, it's getting too far now. This is, you know, it's yeah. all different genders, gender neutral this and gender that and gender this, I identify as a unicorn, I identify as a rhinoceros, like, what the hell is going on? So it's kind of like, where do we draw the line with all of this? Where do we, you know, and, and this is where it gets confusing. Yep. And this, and they're doing this on purpose. These elitists, they're doing Absolutely. this on purpose. They're creating all this chaos and this confusion so that when they introduce the New World Order manifesto, we will accept it because it'll be better than where things are heading now. Mm. Right? So, yeah. so things, so the moment, they're kind of talking about normalizing pedophilia. Have you seen this? Like, yeah, they we're talking yeah, about yeah. in yeah. Parliament here yeah, in the UK, yeah. they're suggesting that maybe we should de- legalize it and make it not so much of a crime. Maybe it's not as bad as we think it is, which is crazy and absurd. But I think they're doing that on purpose so that when the new world order comes in, they'll say, no, pedophilia is out. So a lot of the people who were against the new world order will say, well, the new world order is not so bad after all, you know, because the old powers that be wanted to normalize it. These people are saying we should stop it. So all of that is create chaos problem reaction solution yep so so it's the same thing with all this gender neutral gender this and confusing people with all these gender things and governments are approving it and they're giving the thumbs up it's confusing people it's making people go crazy like i don't understand what's going on but when the new world order comes in and says oh no 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 we're gonna pull this back a bit you know it's gone too far you know the new world order the new manifesto says there is male female transgender, gay, lesbian. All the other ones, we're gonna bend them now. That's crazy, it went too far. And of course people will go, oh yeah, we can live with that. Yeah. So, so all it of it becomes is, a process yeah. of negotiation almost where, right, Brilliant. they reach a middle point where, yep. okay, this is too over the top, that's too extreme, yep. fundamentalist, whatever, and I don't mean from a religious perspective, but just in a belief system. Yep. So let's bring it to some center point where they can get a, perhaps a, a critical mass of people to say, okay, okay. That's a very good point, Martin, because one of the things that I, you know, I know from doing all this work is that this whole apparatus is extremely complex. Yeah. It's very dynamic. The roots reach far and wide. It's like an octopus with its tentacles. It's all over the place. It touches everything. It controls everything. Um, so, uh, everything that they have in place or everything they plan on doing is cause and effect. Every cause has an effect. Every effect has a cause. Everything. It's, it's very, in a way, it's brilliant in the way the whole thing is designed. Uh, because like you said, problem, reaction, solution, they, they have a response or an answer to everything. Yeah. Sooner or later, there's a response and there's an answer to everything. And um, 
And not everybody's going to like it, and there are going to be people that will, and there are going to be people that are in between, and that's that's what's going on. That's the dynamic that's in play. Whether people want to accept it or not, that's your call. But based upon the work that I'm doing, that's what I see going on. Uh, it's really a very, very elaborate, I don't want to call it a game, because game is probably not the right word, but for lack of a better term. System. Yeah, a very elaborate system. Thank you. That's in place. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Millions and millions of touch points. Yeah. Yep. And, the, and the ones, unfortunately, this is the saddest part of all of this, is I like the way you worded the term. It's going to be a negotiation. And that's what it's going to be. It's yep. going to be a negotiation. And it's almost going to be like, you know, it's all going to get worse. Things are going to culminate, you know, leading up to the event. I think the world's going to get darker more yeah. confusing things are just going to get more crazy and they're doing that on purpose to make people back people more into a corner and then when the event happens that is when it's really going to hit the height of madness craziness chaos everyone on earth and then out of that that is when they will the antichrist will come in with a new solution the being from eden the beings from eden will come in and go oh hang on guys let's Let's negotiate. Let's try and sort this out. Let's try and calm all this down. What is the problem? People will say, oh, the problem is the monetary system. You know, it's not fair. There are rich people, poor people. They'll say, all right, we'll end that. Let's have one currency. Yeah. Who will go, oh, actually, yeah, we'll have one currency. That way there's no poverty. We won't have this. All right. What else is a problem? Wars. People are dying for nothing. You know, we're all going to war. Well, to end that, let's have one army. That way we can't fight each other. You've got no one to fight. Right? The only people we're protecting are each other or ourselves from other beings. People will go, oh, yeah, that sounds great. What else is a problem? Oh, this whole thing of gender and race and pedophilia, it's gone out of hand. We're all for, you know, live and let live, but this has gone too far. All right, so maybe we'll cancel all these other things that are too far, but can we keep these? In between that, there'll be many people, unfortunately, most of them, the religious people, who will refuse any of those deals. They'll say, no, we don't want any of it. We want to go back to the Bible. And those are the people who will be locked up in the FEMA camps. Those are the people who will be arrested. Those are the people who will be called dissidents and crazies. And they, they're not willing to negotiate. We're trying to make the world a better place. What, 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 you know, why are you trying to disturb the peace? You are disturbing the peace. Everyone else in the world is in agreement, but you're not. You need to be locked up. Yeah, it's like reorientation camps. I hate to say that, but... <laughs> exactly that. Another area where they will probably raise a flag to people is, you know, medicine is too expensive. Yeah. Uh, it's too costly. Uh, you know, we don't have cures for this. We don't have cures for that. I mean, there's a yep. lot of suffering, even with the, the best medical system in the world. And they would come in and say, okay, we're going to fix that too. There's, there's, yep. a, lot of, there's a lot of stuff like cannabis, as an example. We use that because we spoke about it. Uh, that's no longer going to be taboo. That's going to be yep. something that anybody can grow. We'll even show you what to do, how to grow it, right? How to get the oils and so on. Yep. So, uh, yeah, I could, I could see where, like you said, but, Martin, in, it, but in exchange, obviously, yep. we'll need to monitor everyone to make sure that everyone's following the rules. We want yep. everyone to be, to be on board. You know, we don't want anyone to disturb the peace now. We finally found peace. We finally found a way that works for the whole world. So we're going to be monitoring everyone. We're going to monitor your calls. We're going to be watching on CCTV. If you fall out of line, you'll have to go into a center to get readjusted. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that, some people aren't going to like that. That's going to sound very Orwellian. And, yeah. Well, that, that's what it is. And, and, you know, this is not something that me and you, this is not new. I think everyone sort of yeah. you know, knows that this is where it's heading, this whole Orwellian, yeah. you know. It's heading that way. You know, people ask me all the time about the surveillance state, and they said, "Do you worry about it?" I said, "No. I mean, worry. Why would I worry about it? It's uh, it, there's nothing I can do about it. Worrying is not going to fix it. You know, they're going to do what they're going to do, and they've they've done what they've already done, and uh, you know, so it just is what it is. I'm not going to stop living my life and worry about something like that. I'm just not going to do it because." The moment I do that is time that's taken away from me from enjoying my life. That's it. So I'm just going to I'm just going to plow forward and move forward. 
this stuff, much much of this stuff that's going on, folks, it's it's larger than life. There is yeah. no there is no stopping it. Yeah. You know, you can march all you want and you could be a keyboard warrior and type out in forums and leave comments on YouTube channels and blogs and you could do that till you know the cows come home. And guess what it's going to change? Nothing. Because yep. Right. There are certain aspects of this agenda which are going to go forward and they it's already been implemented in, in most yep. cases. It's all ready there. So the train yep. has left the station and I'm not trying to sound like a defeatist. I'm not. It's, it's a re, it's being a realist. And then once you understand that that's where it's at, what you have to do is you have to go inside. You have to go within you and decide where is it? Where is it that you're supposed to be? Where's the best place for you to be? Consciously. Where should you be spending your time? What should you be focused on? Is it focusing on things that are just inevitable or are going to happen or are already in place? Or is it taking it beyond that, transcending all that stuff? That's how it, you have to transcend it. You have to go outside the box. And in my view, I don't want to get on my spiritual wagon here, but that means you have to connect back to spirit. You really do. A big part of the problem that we have in the reality that we're in, Martin, in my view, and you've, you and I have spoken about this, is it has detached us from the Creator. It has detached us from Spirit. And a big lesson uh, because of that process is to teach us what it's like to live and exist in a place that is detached from, from Spirit. To feel that duality, that darkness, that loneliness, Maybe that despair, for a lot of people, it's despair, the challenges that come along with it, and to spark us back to making that connection. Because once you make that connection, what happens is things in your life will get better. Things will turn around because you are reconnecting back to a huge piece of you, huge, the non-physical aspect of you that m many people have abandoned. Yeah. Um, because they just focus on the physical world and the issues of the physical world. But we're not just physical beings. That's the thing, you know. So you're only, as I've said in so many other shows, when you do that, you're only playing football on half the field if you're only focused on the physical piece of it. If you move to the spiritual, the non-physical, the metaphysical aspects of it, and you really try to start to understand that stuff, like a lot of the stuff you're taking us through is in, in that arena. It's understanding the mysteries. It's under, it's uncovering you know, the real truth behind existence and why we're here. Your life is going to just blossom. You're going to expand what you know, and a lot more things are going to make sense, and you will be less fearful of things, right? That's yeah. what I found. I found that I'm much – I don't really fear anything, Martin, to be honest with you anymore. I the truth will set you free. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's fantastic. Like to end this, um, you know, on to, for, for me on a closing note, um, people are going to listen to this, and there will be three tiers of people. Like I always say, there's going to be the first tier of people who are going to say, "If this is true, I'd rather die for my Jesus. I'll go to these camps. I'm never letting go of Jesus. I'm never letting go of the Bible and the truth in the Bible. In fact, we're told in the Bible that we're going to be persecuted. Many Christians will tell you." I'm right. prepared to die and suffer and be tortured for my Jesus and for my God. I will not let it go for anything or anyone. That is what's going to happen to you. You're spelling that and that is your faith. That is, that is going to happen to you. You're going to be in the FEMA camps. They're being built just for you and you are willingly accepting it. So that's what's going to happen for you. So that's the first tier. The second tier is the majority. You are going to go, do you know what? If that happens, it doesn't sound that bad, actually. It sounds like a, quite a nice world. No wars, you know. We don't have to worry about the financial imbalance in the world. There'll be medicine for everyone, so no diseases. There'll be more equality, a fairer system. Okay, we'll lose some freedoms, but on balance, that world sounds better than the world we're in today. So that's majority of people. Majority of people say, yeah, bring it on, whatever. I just want to have a good life and enjoy my life. I want to raise my kids in, an, in a good world. And I want to enjoy my life and be happy. And then there are those who are going to say, I'm not willing to accept either of those. You know, I don't want to be tortured because I don't agree with a lot of the things. But at the same time, I don't want to compromise. I'm too far ahead to compromise those things because I don't want to live in a world like that. Because 
I'm not, you know, I don't sync with it. So what is the other alternative? And the other alternative is to move on, right? So this is where I am. For me, staying behind in that Orwellian world, even though it sounds nice and it's utopian, for me, for where I am, I don't think I'd be happy in that world. I'm not willing to give up some of my freedoms to gain some of those good things. Right. Neither am I willing to die or suffer standing for what I believe in. So the alternative is I've got to move on. My code has changed. I've got to go to where my code is in sync with, right. or starting to get in sync with. So that is Eden. I now know where that is. And that's most of us who don't feel like we belong here anymore. We don't feel like this is home. We feel like, you know, I, I just, I, I don't want to be here. Right. That's the feeling that I have. It's, it's yeah. one where I feel I'm out of place, like I'm a fish out of water. And like we mentioned in the last show, uh, what could wind up happening is that uh, we're going to continue to do the work that we're doing uh, until the day that we're not here anymore. And then it will be sorted out uh, once we uh, go back home and uh, we decide what our next experience is going to be or our next incarnation is going to be. Absolutely. So uh, personally for myself, I, I mean, I see myself just continuing to play out the role that uh, I have been uh, given, you know, uh, for this life, which is the work that I'm doing right now. And um, once I do cross over, uh, we'll get to the blackboard, <laughs> or the whiteboard, and we'll, we'll figure out what uh, my soul's next journey is going to be. So that's why, you know, Martin, I don't really worry all that much about all of this stuff, because in my in my mind, I have an innate understanding of how it works, you know. So, uh, but I'm with you. I I think, like before, we mentioned it's a negotiation. So, the negotiation means it's a compromise, and most people will be okay with that. But there are going to be those that are going to say, you know, you know, I, I'm not into negotiating and compromising because that's still something that it's good, it's better, maybe, you know. But I need to move beyond that. I'm already moved beyond that. I'm beyond the compromise and the negotiation aspect of this, you know. Yeah. So anyway, so Martin, it's always great to have you on the show and um, to talk about this type of stuff, because like you said, who else are we going to talk to? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. Exactly, Martin. And, um, and for those of us that are watching this show on YouTube, um, we're glad that you're with us as well. So, well, Martin, I think, um, that pretty much wraps it up, unless you have any parting thoughts, anything? No, that's it. I think we covered as much as we could today. Okay, very good, Martin. Again, thank you, my friend. And I don't know if we're going to probably catch up before the holidays. So have a great holiday, Christmas, whatever it is that your family celebrates. And uh, I'll catch up with you uh, in the beginning of the new year. Yeah, likewise. Thank you so much, Mike. It's been a, a pleasure as always, always, always. And uh, yeah, have a happy holiday. Thank you, Martin. Happy holy day. Bye-bye <laughs> <Yeah, go. laughs> now. Cheers, Mike. And that concludes another Sage Quay interview, and I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I did. Links to my guests' websites and social media are listed in the description box below. And as always, I would like to thank everyone for listening and visiting the blog. You can find all my social media and web links by visiting my hub website at sageofquay.com. Also, if you get a moment, please visit laboroflovemusic.com to check out my music and album releases. And remember, live in truth and always serve creation. It's really that simple. See everyone with the next show. Be safe, enjoy, and God bless.
Let go.